Hello, this is Bill Phillips from the National Institute of Standard and Technology and I am Vanderlei Banhato from University of São Paulo, Brazil and we both members of the C2 Commission of IUPAP. This commission promotes units and fundamental constants. And today we'll be speaking about the new international system of units. As you know, the present system of units has its roots on the meter, the kilo, and the second. And for a long time it was called MKS system. But with the time and the necessity, new units were incorporated to the international system of units, and today they have different names. Even that we were able to measure quite well the meter and the second along those years, the kilo still remains more or less as in the original convention that took place in 1875. We still have uh, the kilo as a block of an alloy of platinum and iridium that's kept well to be compared with copies all around the world in a way to make sure that everybody uses the same kilo. The meter for a while was also an artifact, was a bar of iridium and was defined and as the science improved the definition changed and today is much better than was before. We are now in a situation that science evolved enough especially with the measurement of fundamental constant, that we feel confident that changes can be made in the international system of unit in order to improve and make it even better for our society. And it's because of these changes is imminent. We are planning to do those changes in a couple of years from now. We decided to explain to you what is this new international system of unit. So, Bill, can you tell us the reasons why we are about to change the international system of units? One of the big motivations for this new SI, which will come into being on International Metrology Day, World Metrology Day, the uh, 20th of May, uh, 2019, uh, this new international system of units is planned to be uh, uh, coming into uh, to being. One of the main motivations was just what you said, the fact that the kilogram is the only remaining unit that is based on an artifact, a small cylinder of, uh, of platinum iridium about that big uh, that's kept under three bell jars in the basement of uh, a building uh, uh, of the BIPM, the International Bureau of Standards, uh, in Sevres, outside of Paris. Now, one of the problems is that the mass of that object defines what we mean by a kilogram. And it's the mass of that object including whatever stuff might be on the surface after it's undergone a specified cleaning procedure. And the problem is that we've seen that over the years different copies of uh, the kilogram that were presumably made in uh, exactly the same way have been diverging in their masses so that when they were first compared uh, in 1875, there was a certain uh, difference in their masses. And since then, a few times since 1875, when they've been compared, they've, they've changed. So something is going on that we don't really understand that is changing the mass of these kilograms. And that's not what we want for a standard. We want standards that are really stable. And besides, it just seems a little bit embarrassing that in this modern age, when um, so many things are defined in such a, uh, a rigorous way, that we should have the basic unit of mass defined to be the mass of a particular single object, object. the international prototype kilogram. And uh, this will be a changing concept, because uh, we're not going to use the artifacts and many of the units will change. So can you explain how the fundamental constant comes about 
to now be incorporated in the international system of units? Exactly. <coughs> the, uh, the change that's going to happen with, uh, with this new SI, which will become our, our, our international system of units in, in uh, uh, 2019, is an extension of what happened in 1983 when the meter was redefined. Up until then, as you said in your introduction, first the meter was an artifact, then the meter was changed to be uh, a certain number of wavelengths of a certain kind of light, and then we had what I consider to be a beautiful redefinition of the meter. The meter was defined as being the length that light travels in a certain length of time. Effectively, the meter was defined by defining the speed of light. In the new SI, we're going to do that same thing, define units in terms of a fundamental constant for four more of the uh, base units of the SI. So the kilogram, the ampere, the kelvin, and the mole will all become defined, not in their old ways, but in a new way by defining a particular fundamental constant for each of them. Okay, so in the new system of units, some of them remain the mm -hmm. way it is, and some of them will be changed. Exactly. So let's elaborate a little more. What it remains as it is? So the, the meter remains as it is. It was already a beautiful definition. In fact, the model for this redefinition. The second remains as it is. It's not exactly defined in terms of a fundamental constant. We can think of it as being defined in terms of the hyperfine frequency of cesium. That's a constant of nature, perhaps not so fundamental, but it will stay the same. In the past, the second was defined as a certain number of periods of that radiation. The, in the new system, it's the same way, except the spirit is a little different. We say we define the hyperfine frequency of cesium to be a certain number. That will stay the same. So the meter stays the same, the second stays the same. The kilogram changes. How do we define the kilogram? We define the kilogram by defining Planck's constant. So how does Planck's constant define the kilogram? Well, let's think about what the units of Planck's constant are. It's joule second. Now, joule second is the same as kilogram meter squared per second. Now, think about this. We've already got seconds defined by the hyperfine frequency. We've got meters defined by the speed of light. And then we're defining a constant that has the units of kilogram meter squared per second. That means we've defined the kilogram. Yeah, so knowing well the fundamental constant, in this case, uh, Planck's constant, we define uh, the kilo. Exactly. So now, uh, experiments that today are called measurements of Planck's constant will, in the new uh, SI, become realizations of the kilogram. What about the ampere? Ah, so the ampere is another thing that's going to change. Today, the definition of the ampere is the current when put through two long straight wires, one meter apart, uh, where the wires are infinitely narrow and infinitely long. Uh, when, when the current between those two wires produces a force of 2 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per meter of length, that's one ampere. Not a very easy definition to realize in the laboratory. Instead, the new definition will depend upon defining the charge of an electron. In the new SI, the charge of an electron will be a certain number of coulombs. Since an ampere is always a coulomb per second, that means that an ampere will be a current of a certain number of electrons per second. OK, so we take the charge of the electrons. We add up the number of electrons necessary to make one coulomb, coulomb per second, right. and that and will that, be the new definition. And that's an ampere, right. So we go from measuring quantities to measure number, because now the ampere will be defined in terms of a number of electrons that pass to in one second in a cross-section of a conductor. Is that right? That's right. But we won't actually do it that way. Today, we can, in fact, count electrons but we can't count them well enough and fast enough to measure amperes by counting electrons. Instead, we will use the uh, Josephson effect 
and the quantum Hall effect together to realize the new SI ampere. Now, the Josephson effect tells us that when we put a certain voltage across a junction between two superconductors, that it produces a frequency, and that frequency is given in terms of the fundamental constant 2e over h. Now, we've just defined e, and we've just defined h. So that means the quantity 2e over h is a defined quantity. So that means we've defined voltage. Now, the quantum Hall effect gives us a Hall resistance, the ratio between uh, a current and a transverse uh, voltage in the quantum Hall effect that is given in terms of uh, e squared over h. We've defined e, we've defined h. h. That means we've defined the quantum Hall unit of resistance. So if we've got voltage defined and resistance defined, we've got current defined according to the definition of numbers of electrons. And we just have to use the uh, quantum Hall effect to give us a voltage, I mean to give us a resistance, the uh, Josephson effect to give us a voltage, voltage, and now we've got a current. And in the current is the SI unit of current. Now it might be that in the future, we'll be able to count electrons well enough and fast enough that that will become the way we measure uh, yeah. current. And it doesn't matter. The definition is still good no matter how we do the measurement. Well, that's great. What about the Kelvin? Mm. Today, the, the Kelvin, the unit of temperature, is defined as being 1 over 273.16 of the triple point of water. So there's a fixed temperature point and up from absolute zero, we define the triple point of water to be 273.16 Kelvin. Now, that seems like it's fine because the properties of water are something that are fixed by nature. But the fact is that water is not always pure. Uh, it's always got things in it. It's always got dissolved gases. It usually has other impurities that are dissolved and the in it. The point it depends a lot on the external conditions. Too. Well, that's one of the Pressure great. Well, okay, like. but that's one of the great things about the triple point is that that the triple point is a fixed point in the thermodynamic temperature and pressure diagram. So when you reach the triple point of water, you've specified the pressure and the temperature. You don't have to specify it in addition. That's why we changed from the ice point, which was where ice melts. That depends on pressure. Sure. The but, triple point. but the triple point defines what the temperature and the pressure is. But it's not very easy to measure. So in the new SI, the temperature scale will be defined by defining Boltzmann's constant. So Boltzmann's constant is, uh, has the units of joules per Kelvin. In a sense, it's a conversion factor between the unit of energy that we call Kelvins for temperature and the unit of energy that we call joules. So uh, once the Boltzmann constant is defined, then temperature is just a matter of measuring the energy of the constituents that make up the body whose temperature we want to measure. So for example, let's say we have a gas of atoms. If we simply measure the velocity distribution of the atoms in the gas, that will give us the, uh, the Kelvin uh, because we've defined what uh, the Boltzmann constant is. And the, what about the mole? Mm. Today, the mole is defined as being the amount of substance that corresponds to uh, having a number of entities of whatever the substance is. You could have a mole of carbon atoms. You could have a mole of marbles. The point is that whatever that thing is, whether it be carbon atoms or marbles, that the number of those things is equal to the number of carbon-12 atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. And that number is what we call Avogadro's number. And today, we can measure what Avogadro's number is. In the new SI, we will define what Avogadro's number is. And a mole of anything will just be an that Avogadro number. number of that thing. And it will just be a number. So it will no longer be that 12 grams of 12, carbon-12 is exactly a mole, it's, it'll be something that has to be measured. And Avogadro's number is no longer something that has to be measured. It will be a fixed number. Oh, and finally, what about the luminous 
uh, unit. Yes, so the candela, the candela will remain the same. So that's the same as it always has been up until now. Okay, so we're going to define this new system in terms of fundamental constants. And we know that science is improving the measurement of fundamental constant all the time. Basically, there is uh, no limit where we can get in precision as science evolves. So it means that we're going to improve each time more the definition of our international units. Is that right? That's right. And, and not only will we be improving it, we will be ensuring its stability. So today, we can make very good comparisons of two platinum kilograms. If I have two platinum kilograms sitting in my laboratory, I can use a, uh, a balance uh, to, uh, to compare them. And I can compare them to something on the order of a microgram, in other words, a part in 10 to the 9. But if I come back a few years later, they may be different by parts in 10 to the 8. So we don't have stability of the standard of mass. In the new SI, that stability will be guaranteed. We aren't yet at the part in 10 to the 9 level, but we are at the level where we've, we get rid of the instability that uh, exists in the old system. Now, electrical units are another example where the new SI is going to improve the performance of electrical units. Today, because it's so difficult to measure amperes by measuring forces between current carrying wires, the way people, in fact, measure current and voltage and resistance is by using the Josephson effect and the quantum Hall effect, as we spoke of before. But because those are not the definitions of resistance and voltage in the SI. What it means is we have two separate sets of measurement. We have the practical way in which we measure voltage and resistance and current using the Josephson effect and the quantum Hall effect. And that's what everyone uses day to day. And then we have the SI, which we measure from time to time. And what we report then is the ratio between the SI ampere and the practical ampere. In the new SI, that difference will disappear. And we will have the very best technology available to measure electrical quantities in the SI. Well, very exciting. For how long the scientific community is being discussing the change that now will be done in two years? Well, I don't actually remember when this discussion started, but early in the 21st century, people became really serious about uh, making this kind of a change. And people have proposed various ways in which this new spirit of the SI, where we define constants in order to define units, uh, would happen. And now we've settled, after a number of years of discussion, we've settled on the idea that we're going to redefine Planck's constant, Boltzmann's constant, the charge on the electron, and the Avogadro number as the constants that will define the new SI. And another thing I should say, while uh, we've spoken about the new SI as if each of the constants, like the speed of light defining the meter, Planck constant defining the kilogram, that there is an association of one constant with one unit, in fact, the real spirit of the new definition is that defining a set of constants will define the entire unit system of the SI. So uh, instead of tying, for example, Planck's constant to the kilogram, we just think of the set of constants as, as defining the entire set of SI units. And this is so exciting because uh, the new units we will be carried in all the matter we have in the universe because the fundamental constants are intrinsically on the matter, on the atoms, on everything we have around us. And this is a complete change in concept, how we define yes. the new units. That's right. Today, uh -huh. if I want to be sure that my kilogram really is a proper measure of mass, I have to take it to Sevres outside of Paris and compare it to the working kilograms that they have there that have been 
compared to the international prototype kilogram. And that's the only way I can confirm that I really have yeah, a kilogram. Have the real kilogram. <laughs> In the new SI, anyone who has a good laboratory for doing these kinds of measurements will be able to realize the kilogram. We'll still use platinum kilograms as transfer standards, but the thing that really defines the definition is, is, is and universal. Now, another thing that's wonderful about the new definition is that it's going to make it easier to measure small masses. Today, when we want to make a small mass, let's say I want to make a uh, 100 gram mass. Well, I, I get a whole bunch of things that I want to be 100 gram. I make them the, the same and make sure that they add up to, to the kilo. To, but you can see that when you get down to sub-gram levels, this becomes difficult. Yes. But any mass that we want can be handled under the new definition uh, using what we call a watt balance. And I'm very excited about the idea of the watt balance because I used to work on that when I first uh, came to NIST. And the idea is we put current through wires and measure the force that's created. Originally, we were doing this to measure uh, the, the SI ampere, but now we use it to realize the kilogram. And because we can convert force into mass, through Newton's law that force is equal to mass times acceleration, and we can measure the acceleration of gravity, we can uh, equate the force due to currents, which we can make as big or as small as we want just by turning the, the, uh, the current up or down. We can equate that force to a mass, and that mass can be as small as we want, but the accuracy can still be very, very good. Finally, Bill, what's going to happen on 20 of May 2019. Will my mass change because you're going <laughs> to redefine the kilo? Well, uh, you might think that because uh, all the definitions change, that all of the, the things like our masses are going to change. But in fact, what will happen is that on that day, we will fix the values of the fundamental constants to be the best values that we know of at that time. And that means that as far as everyone is concerned and as best as anyone can measure, the definition of the kilogram will be exactly the same on May 21st as it was on May 19th. Okay. And after that, things may change. But on that day, all of the units are absolutely continuous. OK, very good. So in 2019, that will be the inauguration of the new international system of unit. That is quite exciting. And IUPAP is very proud through the Commission C2 to be part of this tremendous improvement on the new international system of unit.